Well, hi everyone. I have a very interesting video to bring to you today. I'm really excited about it. About two weeks ago, I did a video about the initial aftermath of the failure of the Corolla Bridge over the Elbe River in Dresden, Germany. And since that time, there hasn't been a lot of new details, but now I have independent data that shows the warning signs were there for years before this collapse occurred. So I'm gonna go through those details here. So this failure occurred on September 11th, around 3 a.m. local time. And it was a miracle really that no pedestrians or traffic was on the bridge. The portion of the bridge that collapsed carried uh, a pedestrian bike lane, uh, walk lane, and uh, rail traffic, as well as uh, water uh, utilities for, for heating. And again, uh, based on what we know, this construction was completed in 1971 and consisted of both pre-stressed concrete elements that were subsequently post-tension. The details on that are still a bit vague, but that seems to be the common methodology for such bridges during the, uh, this time period. So as a reminder, we're talking about the city of Dresden in Eastern Germany. Now the data that was provided to me, this independent data, comes from a company called Value Space. Uh, they reached out to me subsequent to one of my previous videos, and they provided this, uh, these analytics on satellite data that's obtained by the European Space Agency, the uh, INSAR satellite data. And uh, they, they did a great job. They sent this to me. They gave me a chance to review it. And it clearly shows that this bridge was in distress prior to its collapse. So I'm gonna go through those details, but I wanna thank uh, Value Space for this information. If you wanna know more about their company, there's a link in the description. So what we're talking about, the INSAR stands for Interferometry Side Aperture Radar. So there's a, a link in the description where the European Space Agency goes over this methodology in general, but this involves satellites sending a radar signal as they pass over the Earth's surface and the wavelength of this radar signal is 5.6 centimeters. And since you're getting coverage every two weeks, you can use this radar data to say compare differences in surface elevation and the resolution is uh, millimeter accuracy. As long as the movement in that period between flights doesn't exceed half a wavelength of the radar signal, in this case, half a wavelength is 2.8 centimeters, the motion can be detected and uh, these trends can be observed for a variety of, of use cases, whether it's bridges, buildings, landslides, dams, there's wide applicability for this technology. So this data comes from the European Space Agency Sentinel-1A and 1B satellites. There are additional satellites that have been deployed and, and more that are coming online uh, in the future. And the advantages are it's high resolution mapping. It can be done, the data can be collected in all weather conditions. It's very cost effective, certainly much cheaper than trying to collect uh, ground-based data or commissioning drone or aircraft flights using say LIDAR. Now you have to be careful. There can be some influences from uh, precipitation and there's a lot of expertise required to accurately interpret these results. So let's look at some of this YouTube footage from the European Space Agency. You have the radar array. It's scanning a swath of the Earth's surface. Obviously it's traveling at a high rate of speed and it makes a, a polar orbit. And as I mentioned, you get passes over a given area every 12 days. So it's a tremendous amount of data. So in this case, Value Space selected an area in and around the Corolla Bridge in Dresden and their analysis identified two key findings. We have area one where the collapse occurred and area two. So I'm gonna go through this in more detail. So here's area one. This is the segment that was included in the collapse on September 11th. Value space went back for a three year period. So from September, 2021 to September, 2024. Uh, I wanna point out this, this data resides in servers from the European Space Agency. It's uh, public source data, but it's essentially just ASCII data. So you have to have somebody that's able to pull that information 
and compile it and analyze it in a meaningful fashion, which is what uh, value space is doing here. And you can see clear trends in deflection of this section of the bridge deck. So the rate of movement or what they refer to as velocity is about an inch a year. So roughly 24 millimeters per year. And that's quite alarming. So this isn't a case where value space had this in their files and they didn't tell anybody. It's, it's, it's a situation where they retroactively went back and said, hey, this area is now of interest. Let's see uh, what may have been going on with it. So this is all independent data. And then interestingly too, on the north side of the bridge, there's a clear trend for uplift over this same time period. So it makes sense if you have bridge spans that are connected and you have one side that's dropping, it can cause the other side to lift up, you know, movement about a fulcrum like a teeter-totter. And I think that's what's happening here. And so if you put the settlement plot on top of the uplift plot, the trends are, are very clear. So that suggests a, a very strong correlation, perhaps a one-to-one -one correlation that because one side was moving downward, the other side of the span was moving upwards. And had city officials been utilizing this data for this specific bridge, I would think they would have gone out there and said, hey, we've got a problem. We may have to close the, the roadway to traffic. We may have to install uh, monitoring, we may have to perform uh, detailed special inspections. There's a variety of things that could be done, but unless you know what's happening, you are in all likelihood gonna miss what's what's rumbling beneath the surface as it were, or what, what may be looming in the not too distant future that could be catastrophic. Let's look at this CCT footage. Unfortunately, these are still images that were recorded every few minutes, so it's not a continuous stream. But if you look in the left of the frame, this is the section that collapsed. So the orientation, the view is to the north. So on the west side, you'll see the lights go out and that section just drop. In a similar fashion, we're looking more or less south. So we're looking from east to west now, and you can see the railroad and pedestrian spans dropped into the river. Now we're looking from west to east, and this area corresponds to the noted deflections in the satellite uh, data obtained from value space. Just another view looking to the east. It's a Google Street view underneath, or as we're approaching the underside of this bridge. So the collapse would have occurred. You see these three columns for this bridge pier and the open span to the next pier. So between these two piers is where the bridge collapsed. It's another view here looking to the north. And as I mentioned, there hasn't been a lot of details released about the nature of this construction, but uh, you can look at the reinforcing there and you can make out some ducts, whether those are from uh, pre-stressed elements or post-tension elements. But uh, there's been local reporting that suggests that corrosion may have been a factor. And also local reporting indicates that this section of the bridge was slated for rehabilitation or repair in 2025. But you know, this bridge being over 50 years old is what you would think would be reaching its end of useful life. I mean, roughly most bridges in the modern era are designed for about a 50 year lifespan, which is interesting is because that's how long the original Corolla bridge lasted. It was built in 1895 in an ornate structure and uh, it apparently survived the massive Allied bombing during World War II. This is a, a bomb damage map. The red areas are the more intensive uh, areas of damage. And uh, here's a Wikipedia entry that said that the, uh, the Germans blew up the bridge in May of 1945. It says to prevent the Soviet advance. They weren't going to prevent the Soviet advance. They were going to try and slow them down. So it suggests that the bridge survived up until that time. And then this bridge was completed during the Soviet era in 1971. So it makes you wonder how good the construction was, how good the maintenance was over the years. You know, as with most uh, industrialized nations that have had infrastructure for half a century or more, uh, it's in a pretty sad state of repair in most cases. And 
this needs to be taken seriously by modern economies in the West to sustain future growth. It, it has to happen with a robust and reliable infrastructure. So now they're rapidly have been demolishing this portion of the bridge that collapsed because there's been flooding throughout Europe and uh, also the channel's been closed to navigation. So some views here of the demolition and uh, they're just trying to get this thing down in a hurry. Under normal circumstances where you had a surprise collapse, you might do the deconstruction in a more forensic fashion or careful fashion to figure out exactly what failed and, and, and uh, what the timeline might have been for that failure to have developed. I, I got these images from a viewer and I didn't, they didn't clarify whether I could use their name, so I, I won't, that's my default position. But you can see some supports here, what they call false work to support the remaining portions of the bridge. And this is just a view showing the comparison of the plots that I showed earlier, but my point of showing this is that this is pure data analytics, but it helps, well, it's really necessary to have a background in civil engineering to make sense of this data. Now, in my company, we do extensive amount of construction phase testing for bridge foundations, testing of drill shaft foundations with cross hole sonic logging as an example, or driven piles using the pile driving analyzer. And in my practice, we ended up deciding that we needed to compile a database because people were making the same mistakes on job after job, or they weren't taking advantage of institutional knowledge about what piles have been installed in the past, where piles had run long or short, what were the typical size and types of piling that had been used in the area. We just saw a trend with consultants in particular of essentially trying to reinvent the wheel for a new bridge when there may be literally dozens within a few miles of this new project. So I'm, I'm well versed in, in data analytics. So you have three main types. You have uh, descriptive analytics, which basically says, let's just get the results. What are the trends? Essentially just presenting, usually graphically, what the results are for a given situation. And that's what you could have here if you don't take it the next few steps, is here's the satellite image and here are the readings for the changes in surface elevation. So if that's as far as it went, that would be merely descriptive analytics. Then you have what's called diagnostic analytics. So for example, with the Corolla Bridge, we know there's a failure, so, and that failure zone correlates with an area of uh, bridge deck deflection in that same location in a period of at least three years leading up to the failure. And then you dig a little deeper and you might find that a post-tension element failed or something of that nature. So when you explain why you've got those data results, that, that's called diagnostic analytics. And then the ultimate step is to get into what's called predictive analytics. So let's say we develop a case history and, for example, let's say we have bridge deck deflection for a period of years and it's suggestive of some structural problem with the bridge. And in this case, we know that span subsequently collapsed catastrophically in the middle of the night. You could inventory your other bridges of similar age and construction and independently collect the satellite data to see if you have similar trends. And so that would be a way of predicting a potential problem with these other bridges. And if you identify such areas of concern, you can implement on-site measures. There's a whole subject called structural health monitoring or SHM for bridge structures. And uh, definition here is the process of design development and implementation of a damage detection or characterization strategy for real-time assessment of structural condition. That's being used on more and more bridges. You know, many states have a high percentage of their bridge inventory that's considered to be poor condition or structurally deficient. But yet very few of those bridges have any type of in-place monitoring. But the bridges that do, you're able to have instrumentation such as uh, accelerometers, tilt meters, vibration monitors, a variety of, of instrumentation that feeds in real time to say a, a, a dashboard. 
And somebody could pull up and say, okay, here's our trend lines. Oh, now all of a sudden we've got this big movement. It's, uh, it's very, very uh, useful. So again, this is a, a good case history using independent data. And it, it's uh, a data-driven process. This goes into an overall concept called infrastructure asset management. So if you're an owner, you have retaining walls, bridges, buildings, it would be very important to correlate raw data readings with other information that you have. So let's say you have a, a set of retaining walls that have to be maintained. You might have a database that has a description of the wall, its age, its height, how much uh, soil may be underlying the foundation before you get to rock, that sort of thing. And then if you overlay these independent uh, data measurements, such as from satellite uh, imagery, you can get uh, tremendous correlations. You might say, oh, we see this type of movement accelerating typically when a wall is 30 years old or something under these conditions. So again, it's a way of keeping track of infrastructure and trying to be proactive in averting disasters and be allowed to implement monitoring or perhaps even corrective measures before bigger problems occur down the road. So what could be the next steps for Germany here relative to their bridges? I think they should identify other bridges of similar age and construction type. So look at these other bridges that were built in the Soviet era using the same type of methodology, which appears to be both pre-stressed and post-tension concrete elements. Look at the uh, NSAR data for these similar bridges. And then compare any trends that are similar to those evident from the problem bridges or case histories to identify other potential problem bridges. And then you want to review inspection records, conduct new inspections as necessary, and perhaps install instrumentation for monitoring. And then overall to this process, you want to continue to generate information that would be suggestive of a root cause, such as um, is there road salts being applied to the bridge deck uh, during the winter? Uh, is there been a history of deferred maintenance and repairs? That sort of thing. And once you get these correlations, it gives you a very strong set of uh, information to effectively manage your projects. And more importantly, to avoid a loss of life from a catastrophic failure. So I have other case histories that I'm developing into videos that rely on this NSAR data that uh, Value Space has provided to me. So um, stay tuned, I'm really excited about this technology. I think it should be used far more often th than it has been, but it's something that's gonna continue to grow. I think it's a tremendous opportunity to be proactive in avoiding major problems with public infrastructure. So with that, I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I'll roll credits at the end, but I really appreciate your ongoing support. I also appreciate the support of those of you who've provided super thanks. I'm continuing to be surprised and quite pleased about the development of the channel, uh, the engagement from the viewers. I, I learned so much doing these videos. So, so please uh, keep up your engagement and stay tuned for future videos.